Okay, so right now I'm going to be reading um, something from the book Anatomy and Physiology from Chapter 17, which is the functional organization of the endocrine system. So I'm going to be talking about lipid-soluble and, and water-soluble hormones. Now the word soluble can be confusing. It basically just means that it can dissolve. So for example, salt and sugar both dissolve in water. So that means that they are both water-soluble. Some things don't dissolve in water, they dissolve in fats. So they are called lipid-soluble. So these hormones are certain hormones um, that either dissolve in water, water-soluble hormones, or lipid-soluble hormones, which dissolve in fats. So some examples of um, lipid-soluble hormones are estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, aldosterone, and cortisol, which basically are all develop, um, having to do with the reproductive system and stuff like that. So what happens is lipid-soluble hormones are very small. So this is the hormone here, and it's small enough that it can squeeze through the spaces in the plasma membrane. This is a cell, and this is the cell's plasma membrane. So it squeezes through because it's tiny, goes through the cytoplasm, and goes to the nucleus where there are a receptor waiting. This is the receptor here. It says the nuclear receptor because it is in the, in the nucleus. So the hormone comes in and binds to the receptor. Um, which then interacts with DNA because DNA is found in the nucleus of the cell. And when, the, when it interacts with the DNA, something called transcription happens. When you transcribe something, it means to like copy or record again. So like if you've heard of a scribe, it's someone who writes down information. So what basically what's happening is a piece of the DNA is being transcribed or copied um, to send it to where it needs to go. So then it comes out and interacts with um, ribosomes, which are in the cytoplasm. They weren't in the picture, so I just kind of like drew little circles to represent ribosomes. Um, the ribosomes are important for um, synthesizing proteins or making proteins. So transcription um, eventually leads to the ribosomes. Now, with water-soluble hormones, the hormones are very large, so they can't actually go through the plasma membrane. So what happens is there are actually receptors that are um, in the plasma membrane itself. They don't show them on here, but in a plasma membrane there are receptors. They're called membrane-bound receptors. Membrane-bound meaning that they are bound to or stuck on the membrane. So these, membra these uh, receptors are on the membrane, and the, when the hormones come floating around, they attach to the receptor on the actual membrane. And then what happens is it once the... Um, the hormone binds to the receptor, it activates what's called the G protein because it's attached. So when it actually makes that connection, it activates it. Now I like to think of the G protein as the group protein, G for group, just because it consists of three parts. It's not labeled here, but um, this this one here is the alpha, this and the one's the middle is the beta, and this one's the gamma part of the G protein. And so what happens is um, a message is transmitted to the G protein, and the G protein communicates to another protein, which eventually gets, gives the, um, the desired result in the cell. And it goes into a little bit more detail about that in the next page here. Um, so, again, we see the water-soluble hormone binding to the receptor, and here it is, the actual the names, the alpha, beta, and the gamma. And... Um, so what happens is, is once it's activated, um, it has something here called GDP. Um, don't worry too much about that. It's not super important. But um, what's important to know is that when it's um, actually activated, well, this is before it's, I'm sorry, this is before it's activated because it was before it actually bound to it. So it has GDP before it's bound. After it binds, it has GTP. You can think of it as like um, adding energy because GDP stands for diphosphate, and T stands for tri. So it's going from 2 to 3. So I like to think of it as like it gained energy when, um, the, when the hormone bound to the receptor. So it gains an energy, so it went from 2 to 3, from di to tri. That's just how I like to think of it. Um, then after that, the A part of the G protein goes off alone. So A for alone, it goes off by itself, and it's going to take the message to whatever um, whatever protein or enzyme that it needs to talk to in order to deliver the results. And after it actually sends a message to the desired 
um, protein, it's going to lose that energy again and go back to GDP. So let's show an example here. Um, okay, so again, we have the water-soluble hormone binding to the receptor. It activated the G protein. So it went from GDP to GTP because it gained an energy. Now, the A is going to go off alone, A for alone, and it's going to stimulate this channel by binding to it. So here it bound to the channel, and it once it bound to the channel, it allowed calcium to rush in. So in that process, it actually went back to GDP, so it kind of lost that energy. So there's, there's lots of different um, things that G proteins do. They do a lot of different things. Um, this is just one example of how it opens up a, ch a calcium channel. Another example here is um, here's a protein that it binds to called adenylate cyclase. Now when the hormone binds to the receptor, it activates the G protein, the A goes off alone, talks to adenylate cyclase, and what adenylate cyclase job is is to turn ATP, which is energy, into something called CAMP. And CAMP is important because it can help with making protein kinase, which eventually leads to the cellular response that was desired. So G proteins show up a lot with A and P, um, but they typically follow a similar pattern. So if you understand the basic, the basic steps that, of with the G protein and the A going off alone and all those different things, you'll be fine.